Hello everybody, welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner continuing Sergey Lang's Basic Mathematics Chapter 6, which has to do with congruence, and Section 4, which happens to do with the inverse of isometries. So inverses, as you are aware, in mathematics. So the inverse of 2 is 1 half. So when you multiply 1 half by 2, you get back 1. And so for every real number, there's an inverse that you can multiply by. There's also an additive inverse, so 2 minus 2 is equal to 0 and minus 2 plus 2 is also equal to 0. So 0 is the identity, I guess, for addition, and 1 is the identity for multiplication. So just like that, with isometries, there is also, well, I can't prove it yet, and you'll prove it later on. It's somewhat easy to prove. But suppose you had these two like this, and these multiply together, and they give you the same answer either way, and they both give you the identity. So we would say g is the inverse of f. Okay, so um, the question is, is there another inverse of f? So let's say we had another um, isometry, h, that we, can multi that we can compose with f, and we can get back the identity. The question here is, are g and h the same? The way we do this is we take h and compose it with f and g together, and we see that on the one hand, if we do f and g first, we're going to get h composed with i, because f and g is i, and so that gets you h. On the other hand, if we do h and f first, well, h and f gives i composed with g, so that is just going to be g. And so we find g and h are actually the same. So this is how we're going to use, um, this is the trick that we're going to use to prove that there is only one isometry or only one kind of isometry and there's no other kind of isometry. So this, this tool is going to be useful in section five as we prove like the complete set of possible isometries. Because if there is only one inverse of an isometry, then there's nothing else to discover about the inverse of the isometry. Just once you find one of them, you found all of them. All right, so what do we do with inverses? Well, um, let's first give inverses a name. So we're going to say uh, the isometry f has an inverse f with the minus 1 like that. And this notation is going to make a lot of sense very quickly. Just, just like 2 to the minus 1 is equal to 1 half. This uh, uh, has, a, has a specific meaning such that f composed with f to the minus 1, either direction doesn't matter, you're going to get back the identity. All right, And if p is what you get if you pass q into f, so if you map q through f and you get p, so p is the image of q under f, then q is the image of f inverse of p. Or we might say q is the inverse image of p under f. q is the inverse image of q under f. q is the inverse image of p under f. Okay, so we can say p is the q is the image of the inverse of f under p, or it's the inverse image of p under f. Not confusing whatsoever. Well, yes, it is slightly. Moving right along. Suppose that F is a reflection through a given line L. So F is a reflection through the line L. Okay. What about reflections through points? Well, we've already proven in the last section that reflections through points are just rotations of 180 degrees. So uh, if you're wondering why that is, you, you can spend some time thinking about it, or you can watch last video. But we're going to suppose that f is a reflection through the line f. Note that when we take f and compose it with itself, well, that's just taking the mirror image of the mirror image, and that gives you the uh, identity, um, the identity mapping. So the inverse image of f is indeed itself, and this doesn't happen in multiplication. Actually, there is one number you can think of that when you multiply it by itself, you get one. So if you take one and multiply it by one, then you get one, but that's the only one. But there are an infinite number of possible reflections through given lines, because there's an infinite number of lines. And so there are an infinite number of these things that if you compose them with themselves, they become their own inverse, okay? And let's take now uh, another example where we take G to be a rotation so g of x, g sub x, is a rotation of x degrees, right, through a given point O or whatever. We note that when we take 
the inverse of a rotation is just rotating by negative those degrees. So if you have a rotation of 90 degrees and you want to inverse that, you just go back 90 degrees. And those two things taken together. So g of x composed with g of minus x. That's just going to be g of x minus x, which is going to be g of 0 degrees. Right? That's why that works. And um, yeah, we also note that if uh, g of 90, also if you compose that with g of 270, which is the same as g of 90 composed with g of 93 times, then g of 93 times is also the inverse because this will give you the identity. Right? g of 90 composed with g of 270 is g of 360, which is the identity. So uh, g of 90 cubed is also in the inverse of g of 90, right? So there's a curious relationship there with rotation. So reflections and rotations have these properties that we don't see with real numbers. What about translations? If we say T O M, so T sub O M is the translation such that T O M of O gives M. So this is the translation isometry. Then what would be the inverse of T O M? Well, that would just be T, I'm sorry, T M O because T O M composed with T M O is the identity, right? So the inverse of the translation is going to be the translation from the destination to the, or the origin. All right. Uh, let's look at some more interesting properties of inverses. What if we want to find the inverse of a composition, right? And you might naively think that this is equal to f minus 1 composed with g of minus 1. However, that would be wrong because if you take f of g and compose that with f minus 1 composed with g minus 1, a g inverse and f inverse like this, then you don't get, you don't get the identity because g composed with f of minus 1, that's not anything that you know. What, what will work, however, if we take f composed with g, so this is not true. Um, f composed with g, and then you take g of minus 1, and then f inverse. So g inverse composed with f inverse is the inverse of f and g. Let's take a look at what happens there. So we have f of g of g inverse of f inverse. And so these two become the identity. f of identity composed with f minus 1. So that's just f composed with f minus 1, and that's just the identity. So this is indeed equal to the identity. Okay. And so when you multiply, you might see some mathematicians, when they see like 2 times 7, and they want to find the inverse of that, they'll multiply by 1 7 times 1 half. Because 7 times 1 7 is 1, and then you have 2 times 1 half, which is 1. So you might see some mathematicians do that. This also occurs in matrices, so this is a common pattern. The inverse of a composition is the inverses of each element reversed. All right. Uh, what happens... If we have an isometry and we compose that multiple times, that's going to be the same as f minus 1 composed with f minus 1, right? And we can just write that down as f minus 2, right? And if we do, if we have this notation, then we could say f to the minus n, where n is a positive integer, is just f to the minus 1 positive integer times. And now we can write the complete set of f to n for any integer where n is any integer, okay? So if f is positive, and when n is positive, okay? And when it's the identity, when n is zero, and it's f to the minus one to the n when n is less than zero, okay? So now we can say for any any number of, of compositions of isometries, we have a general rule for any integer. And of course, the relationship uh, f to the m plus n, that's just f to the n composed with f to the n, right? And that works for positive or negative integers now. All right, a little bit more to go here, just an example. So in this example, we're gonna have t be the translation one inch to the right. So this is a translation. One inch to the right. Okay. So t to the minus one would be a translation one inch to the left. We're going to say up, or u, is a translation one inch up, and then u inverse is a translation one inch down. Right. 
So now we can describe any kind of translation using these four, well, two basic translations. So we have t to the n, u to the n. That's just going to be a translation uh, in right, or let's say n here, n right and m up. Okay, where n or m can be positive or negative integers. We haven't done fractionals, so don't be confused. We can't do like one half inch, although it really is tempting to say t to the one half would be a translation one half to the right. But it's not going to be general because how do you do half of a reflection, right? So we're not going to be able to do things like that quite yet. With translation, it might work, but otherwise it might not. Okay, corollary of theorem three. Recall theorem three. It's going to be an important theorem, especially in the next section. I'll lead off describing theorem three. Theorem three said that if you have a, uh, a isometry with three fixed points, P, Q, and M, such that P, Q, and M are not on the same line, that F must be the identity. Okay, this is theorem three. There's no other possible isometry. There's no other possible mapping that can, or no pop other possible isometry that can that can keep three fixed points and not be the identity. Okay, so the corollary is that um, F minus one exists. So we're going to assume, and G is, um, oh yes, F minus one exists. And we're also going to talk about G such that it has three, the same three fixed points. It's an isometry. We note that not only does F equals G, but uh, F minus one exists. So if you, if you assume that F minus one exists, proving that F and G are the same and there's no other possibility, is rather easy. I'll let you figure that out. In the next section, we're going to do very similar reasoning to this. So if you don't understand how to solve this, you can watch the next video and get some clues on how to solve this. And finally, let's suppose we have K is a vertical line and V, L is a horizontal line. So we have K is this line over here and L is this line over here. And then we have V is a reflection with respect to K, okay? And we have H be a reflection with respect to L. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, if we had a point, let's say we start here in this quadrant, okay? Let's use a different color here. Let's use green. So that's the point P. So if we applied a, a V, V will reflect it through K, and H will reflect it through L. And if we apply V again to H, then we get V of H of P and we get a point there. And if we apply H to V, then we get H of V of P, okay? So we get this interesting property that H of V is the same as V of H. So in this case, we do get commutati commutativity for these isometries, these particular isometries. And there's gonna be a bunch of problems later on that do with these and doing multiple of them at the same time, and you'll figure out some pattern. It's, it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, if you're wondering why this is so interesting, because he's touching on a more advanced math topic called group theory, which uh, you should get into after you've done calculus. Um, also, there's a remark at the end. We haven't yet proven that every isometry has an inverse, but it will be proved later that it's every isometry has an inverse. One of the ways that you do that is you have to prove um, what the complete set of isometries looks like, and then looking at that complete set, you can find how many inverses exist for it. So. Thank you for the time. I hope you guys have a good day. Take care and bye-bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. This video is part of my series on Sergey Lang's basic mathematics. You can click here to watch the rest of the videos in the playlist. You can click here to learn more about me and you can click here to support my channel. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.